everyone who's anyone knows. If you want to understand the Toreador, ask a follower of Set. And I would say that you are definitely someone, Madam Filth. I hope this letter finds you well, my dear friend. It's been far too long since we last worked together, and I've missed our little chats and schemes. Do you remember Moscow? It must have been 60 years ago since I seduced the prince and worked that little piece of information about Karl Schreck from him. Who would have thought the famous Tremere Justicar would be such a little degenerate? I suppose you did, since you hired me to sniff out the evidence. But I admit, even I was a little surprised. And I like to think I always assume the worst when it comes to Kindred. I felt a swell of excitement when I received your letter. My first thought was, what is that wicked little beast up to now? Say what you want about Madame Phil, but she's never boring. I was surprised that instead of proposing another job, you want to know my meditations on the Toreador clan. Very well, since you are my favorite little sewer rat, allow me to indulge you. When I wish to partake in the cultured gatherings of the Camarilla, I sometimes find it necessary to borrow an identity, and my first choice is almost always one affiliated with the Toreador. As a follower of Set with a reputation for success, sometimes my presence in the courts of the Ivory Tower can be controversial, if you can imagine that. While I never shy away from much-deserved attention, I don't want to make all the talk of a Camarillo domain about little old me. But when an orchid finds she needs some anonymity, where better for her to rest than among the roses? The Toreador are known for being the most beautiful, glamorous, and creative kindred in the knights of any age. They are the true patrons of culture in canine societies and are responsible for most of the aesthetic trends we kindred cling to. And in the time I've spent pretending to be one of them, I've learned a great deal. Artists love to talk. And the only thing they enjoy talking about more than their artwork is themselves. The profitable gossip I cannot share, I'm sure you understand. But the generalities? With those, I'll spill the tea for free. Let's start with a story. Once upon a time, thousands of years before we started counting years, the most beautiful woman ever to grace a ziggurat was working on a piece of artwork. This woman was a vampire, but that wasn't the most interesting thing about her. What made her the cat's pajamas with all the phony gods of the second generation was her art, which had the ability to touch the cold, dead hearts of these strange alien monsters. On this particular night, we don't know whether the work was a sculpture or a painting or a performative flute dance. The Book of Nod fragments don't say. But after working on it for 101 years, she would present the artwork to Cain himself. And Papa Cain was so overwhelmed by it that he made all the vampires in Enoch come to see. And the experience these old leeches had upon seeing it created the road of humanity. You know, 
the default belief system of all vampires. The artist's name was Erico, and she was the first Toreador, and kind of a big deal. People called her Cain's Blossom, and her child were originally called the Clan of the Blossom, which would become Clan of the Rose. When you hear that story, you can understand a lot about why the Toreador are the divas they are. They are very particular about who they embrace, looking for candidates who are at the top of their creative game. Being beautiful helps a lot. But if you're genuinely great at your craft, the Toreador may overlook a blemish or two, though more than that might cause a Toreador an existential crisis. And while what we generally think of art certainly has powerful appeal to the roses, so do more practical skills, like martial art or the artistry of political maneuver. When we think of the civilizations that have created enduring works of beauty, we find that the Toreador had strong presences in these cultures, serving as patrons or inspirations. After everything went south in Mesopotamia, the Toreador migrated to Greece and Rome, and we know how that story goes. These places become fountains of artistic beauty that define our aesthetics even in the 20th century. The roses flourished in the soil of the Roman world to be sure, but there was a snag. And while the Ventru are second to none when it comes to the plodding details of running a government, their appreciation of aesthetics is, should we say, limited? Opportunity would arise when Rome fell and the Toreador stepped out of the shadow of Clan Ventru and into the moonlight of ruling Constantinople. There, Michael, the child of Erichel, would portray himself as an archangel. And for a thousand years, the city became a beacon of light and beauty in the Canite society under his guidance. Michael would inspire something called the dream. It was about building an architectural marvel, repository of culture and social experiment all in one. A recreation of what the mythic cities ruled by Canaanites should have been. He sought to create a lasting monument to the race of Cain, an artwork not limited to canvas or the stage but the fabric of human history itself. And of course, in the end, it failed, as all things do. The seeds of destruction are sown in a thing's birth, and depending on kindred is like building a house on a foundation of sand. By the Middle Ages, the Roses had made their way deep into the Catholic Church and used the resources of that faith to sponsor great artworks around Europe. They had also found themselves the dominant clan in France, where they began an interesting experiment. I can't help but roll my eyes at the name, but the Toreador Courts of Love were an important innovation in Canite culture, because in many ways they were a precursor to the Camarilla. The Courts of Love began as a social movement among Toreador of Western Europe, taken with the emerging concept of chivalry in its most poetic expressions, and quickly became one of the gathering points for Canites with interests in knighthood, where those who proved their worth through skill at arms and wit gained status and followers. The courts were under the aegis of four Toreador monarchs, kindred with enough power and influence to hold sway over multiple domains and regions of France. 
While the courts of love rarely issued direct commands to local princes, a queen or king had great persuasive authority. The courts came to their height when the various princes of France discovered that they were a great tool to secure one's domains and advancing one's agenda. Soon enough, that advantage became an outright requirement for those seeking power, and the courts of love had become the major axis for intrigue and strife among French vampires. But again, it was inevitable that the courts of love would fall, and they would do so as so many things did under the storm of the Inquisition. But this time, the inspiration remained, for it was a member of Clan Toreador. Surely, with the example of the courts of love in mind, who would rally many European kindred to the flag of the young Camarilla. Raphael de Corazon would deliver an impassioned speech at the Convention of Thorns, and with the power of his oratory, enshrine the masquerade, the foundation of Camarilla rule at the meeting. And in every night following that fateful October in 1493, the Toreador have been one of the most important parts of the Ivory Tower. Though as one would expect from artists, a number of contrarians found themselves outside it. With our history lesson out of the way, let's talk about the Toreador in the modern night. Unlike clans like the Tremere or Ventru, the Toreador do not have a formal hierarchy. In a domain, they may loosely gather in a guild. While this has something of an artistic ring to it, most Toreador in the city are considered members. The head of a guild is typically the oldest and most influential Toreador within the city, with the other members forming a complicated social system, the rules of which boggle many an outsider. I once wiggled my way into a Toreador guild where the pecking order was decided by poetry, composed on the spot in response to a random selection of Italian literature the host would pull from the shelf. While I said they don't have a formal hierarchy, that doesn't mean they don't have divisions. There are two main types of Toreador, from their point of view. Artistes and Posio. The artistes consist of the sculptors, the painters, the musicians, and the writers. They consider themselves to be the real Toreadors, as inheritors of the clan's original values and goals. The posers make up the other faction. They can include the failed artists, as well as the professional critics and those who consider their bodies to be their life's masterpiece. The Posers are home to one of the clan's most tragic groups as well. Those artistes who were once masters of a niche that was once popular and no longer is in fashion. Bad artists, in other words. Can you imagine how sad that would be one moment to be the toast of the roses, the next to be considered a pathetic fraud. It is delicious to witness. The Toreador are complicated in many ways. They portray themselves as the closest to the living, breathing pulse of the mortals around them. 
They claim that this proximity is what keeps them so vital and modern. Their knowledge of mortal trends and fashion, trends and entertainment is second to none. Many roses have mortal families or assume mortal identities in order to capture the breath of life that is denied to them. But this constant pressure can cause a Toreador to break down, losing all of their creativity and motivation in the process, resulting in a debauched individual and desperately searching for the next kick to experience that feeling of being mortal again eventually turning to mortal vices like drugs in order to feel just this one aspect. The older Rose gets and the more mortal associates he has watched die, the more likely a burnout is to occur. Other clans may suffer under this aspect of their existence, but no clan suffers as greatly as the Toreador. Art is the cornerstone of the clan, defining its clan's curse and shaping the preferences of every Toreador. Oh, how they crave it, just as they crave the very blood that sustains them. The roses are not artists by choice as much as they are by nature. As each Toreador desperately searches for something that anchors their passion and preserves it from withering away with the ages. The desire to preserve art and artists is, more often than not, the impetus for an embrace. But, my dear friend, you know how it is with the Toreador. They can be so fickle and their tastes change with the wind. It's all too easy for them to become bored with their talents. And when that happens, well, <laughs> let's just say that things can get quite interesting. I must admit, I do find their struggles quite amusing. The relativity of art is one of the major conflict points within the clan especially between elders and neonates. The elders refuse to think of modern developments like jazz or dadaism as art forms, while neonates are often frustrated over the conformity of art that the elders seem to espouse. But, my dear Madam Filth, you and I both know that art is whatever one wants it to be. And as a follower of Set, I have always found that revenge and intrigue can be the most beautiful art form of all. There was a niche of Toreador elders who share that view and commit themselves fully to this, finding ways to utterly crush their rivals and drive them to suicide without even lifting a hand. Truly, the pursuit of art knows no bounds. And darling, the Toreador may be prisoners of their artistic visions and sensitivity, but what a delicious prison it is. They can't help but be overcome by the beauty that surrounds them, whether it be a masterpiece painting, a mesmerizing neon sign, or even the most breathtaking sunrise. But don't you worry, with a little willpower and a lot of seduction, the roses can break free from their captivation and leave a trail of adorning admirers in their wake. But let's be real. What fun is being in love with something that is so easy to have? The thrill of the chase, 
the seduction of the unattainable. Now that's where the true art lies. And yes, they may leave a trail of broken hearts and discarded projects. But that's just the price of true passion. My advice to Toriador, whenever I pretend to be one of them, embrace the chaos, my dear. That's where the real beauty lies. As I pen these final words to you, I am filled with a sense of deja vu. I know you, you filthy little animal. You have a plan. And I think you are wetting my appetite with your questions. The game is afoot, and I am ready to make my move. The Toreador may be trapped by their own artistic visions, but I am not. I am free to indulge in every pleasure this world has to offer, and I intend to do just that. And I do so enjoy how you harvest the fruit of my little adventures. With a sly smile, I raise my glass to you, Madam Phil, in the hopes that our paths will cross again soon. Until then, I bid you adieu with a promise that the next time we meet, the stakes will be higher and the game even more. Thrilling. Yours in mischief, Jasmine, follower of Set, Berlin, June 1944.